Hello and welcome to the very first episode of every single science fiction film ever. Almost. Um, for more information on what this podcast is about, you need to go back and listen to the trailer and that will give you all the information about the show. Before we get to every single science fiction film ever, we have to answer one very serious question. What is science fiction? Um, I am not qualified to answer that, but luckily I have managed to procure two very qualified human beings who are here to help us. Um, a bit more on those in just a minute. I just wanted to say, before anyone gets too excited or outraged that we finally have a definition, um, that's not going to happen. I've been researching this for months and there is no way there's going to be one definition that comes out of this. We may try, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, what we will give you is a lot of um, depth and understanding on the different definitions that are out there, hopefully busting some myths and a lot of hearty opinion on what science fiction is and what science fiction isn't. So let's go to our guest. Uh, let me introduce you to Lisa Yazik, who is Regency Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech. She's written many books about science fiction and has so many accolades that I'm going to put them in the show notes, otherwise I'll be talking for too long. Um, and hello, Lisa, how are you? Hi, it's so great to be here today. I'm doing great, thanks. Brilliant. With her, we have Glyn Morgan, who is curator of exhibitions at the Science Museum in London. Now, I went to one of Glyn's exhibitions last year called Science Fiction, Voyage to the Edge of Imagination, which I think is a great title. That exhibition is now in Hong Kong. Is that right, Glyn? Yes. Yeah, it's on a global tour and its first stop is Hong Kong Science Museum. It opened there at the end of December last year. Yeah. Brilliant. And how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. Uh, really excited to be here. Okay. So the definition of science fiction is very contested. I'm going to go, first of all, to a dictionary definition, which is fiction based on imagined future scientific or technological advances and major social or environmental changes frequently portraying space or time, travel and life on other planets. But there is a Wikipedia page with over, well, approximately 40 definitions from some of the biggest names in science fiction, and they very often are contradictory. So to begin the show, I want to go over to our guests and ask them, what is your favorite definition? What is the definition that you go with? Uh, Lisa, first over to you. Right. So, I mean, first of all, I absolutely agree with you. There are as many definitions of science fiction as there are people who read and write and create it and draw it and produce it and consume it and eat it for breakfast and whatever else it is that people are doing with their science fiction these days. The kids, who knows, right? Um, so I, I, I do th having said that though, I, most of us can point at something and say, yeah, this is science fiction or it's not. So I, I do think there are some commonalities here. So I don't want to overstate how impossible it is to define the term, but I do like to work with sort of, uh, loosened up or more expansive versions of, of definitions myself. And so my personal favorite definition is, is from Darko Suvin from 1979. Darko Suvin was one of our first science fiction critics and he wrote this book, Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, where he lays out sort of three main characteristics of what he considers to be, uh, science fiction and particularly good science fiction, but uh, good is a whole other history that we don't need to get into right now. Um, and I think a lot of it still works as long as it's in a sort of expanded form, right? So, uh, so Suvin talks about three characteristics. He talks about how science fiction is defined by the presence of a novum, a, a new thing, right? That's the Latin word for new thing. It's the big word my students just learned yesterday. They're very excited <laughs> about it right now. And in particular, he suggests it should be a technological or scientific thing or a techno-scientific novum even. And I think that that's true and that maps to a certain extent to your dictionary definition. But I really think if we've learned nothing else in the last uh, few decades is that we uh, are, as Westerners in particular, need to open up our definitions of what constitutes science and technology and look at how those 
categories are historically constructed, right, to privilege certain groups of people, usually those in charge of colonial and other kinds of exploitative endeavors, and used to uh, marginalize and even erase the, the, the techne, the techno-scientific, the methodical practices and ways of knowing the world that everyone has always had throughout history, right? So as long as we're willing to go with an expanded definition of science and technology, still thinking that part works with the novum. The second characteristic that Suvin talks about is that science fiction is set in an alternate historical framework to our own present moment. And that seems to me like a characteristic that I feel like stays pretty true through time and space. I'm sure now once I've said that, everyone's going to come up with some example that contradicts me. But I actually really do feel like it, it, it can't usually be in your own reality, right? Because you've got that techno-scientific novum, the thing that makes the difference between your world and the other world. So of course, it's going to be in another world. So I think that's a good one. Mm. And then finally, I think the part of Suvin's definition that's often been most contentious and difficult for people is the last part where he talks about how science fiction should induce a specific kind of reading process or uh, intellectual process in people, right? Uh, a sort of cognitive estrangement that while we recognize parts of the science fiction world, other parts were like, why is it like it? How did it get this way? And as science fiction uh, fans, we know if we go into the world, it's likely that at some point someone's going to more or less explain to us how the world got this way. And then, right, according to Suvin, the magic really happens then when the reader or, or the audience member leaves the science fiction text and goes back to their own world and is suddenly just as estranged from that world. And they're like, well, if the fictional world could have been built and mm. fashioned by humans and changed by humans, then why can't our own world? I love this, except for Suvin, right? He wanted it to induce a very specific estrangement. And you are supposed to leave the science fiction story estranged from the workings of modern day capitalism. And I think that's awesome if a story can do that. But I think that if we're going to tie every single science fiction story to that, we're going to end up with a very limited pool of stories. Um, I mean, you know, and if you read Suvin himself, like the only person he can consistently uh, quote is Ursula Le Guin and maybe Stanislaw Lem, actually. So he's probably got two science fiction authors, but it really narrows the pool. But to me, and this is something my students and I were talking about, as long as you leave the book estranged from something, preferably re related to science and society, but somehow estranged from the, nat the natural or everyday in quote marks, right, workings of the world, thinking that's not natural, we could do this differently, then, then I think you've got a science fiction story. Yeah, it's interesting because when you say, um, like, you, you might leave the science fiction story, movie, whatever, um, and feel like you're going to change the world, very often you kind of go, well, humanity is awful and we can't do anything about it. So, it's, you know, it depends on the human how they react to that rather than um, in one particular way. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't necessarily mean it would inspire the individual to go change the world. I think that's mm. asking far too much of a, of, a, of a genre whose main function is to entertain um, and, and then, well, also to sell things, but to, to, to leave with the sense that the world itself can be changed, that, that the relations of the world are not natural. Ah. So for instance, yesterday we started reading a novel, um, where in this future, uh, kids don't have a gender, they're it's until they pass certain milestones in the world. And my students, they could not do it for the first 30 minutes of class. They had to keep putting, trying to put a gendered pronoun in, right? And, and when I, and, and or keep trying to theorize like, well, what is the trauma that caused this in the world? But the longer we spent in the world and the more familiar it became, all of a sudden by the end, they could talk about children as it's without getting freaked out, without feeling like this was some traumatic or abusive experience. And, they're, by the end, they were thinking about gender a little bit differently and the fact that maybe people don't have to have a gender from the minute, from the from before they're born even, right? Yeah. Um, and that, that you could call someone an it without it being uh, derogatory, which in our own yeah, world, it, it usually is profoundly yeah. Yeah. derogatory, right? And whereas with this character, by the end, you're so into the character that you're like, it's the best thing ever. I can't believe it was just <laughs> double-crossed like this. Wow. Cannot wait to find out what's going to happen. And it's, it's a different experience to keep using that same word. But I think a lot of them walked out thinking a little bit differently about why they always default to certain kinds of pronouns. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I just wanted to get back to what you said about it being a genre for entertainment. Are you talking about the cinema part of that or the 
the fiction, like the literary part of that as well. I'm talking about science fiction as the together. broad big tent, right? As games, as videos, as poetry, as sculpture, as lawn art, you know, however you want to define it. I think <laughs> that our modern understandings of science fiction absolutely evolved in tandem with the rise of mass literacy and the rise of the mass media. And it's shaped by a media that was selling this as entertainment. And uh, yeah. do you want to read a science? Do you want to engage a science fiction object you're not entertained by? And yeah. entertainment can be broadly defined. It doesn't mean you're happy and you feel like all's right in the world. Like sometimes it's really entertaining to be revolted by things or horrified by things. Absolutely. Yeah, very good point. Over to Glyn in that, who I believe has a, a lot more concise <laughs> a definition. So Glyn, tell us. Yeah. Um, yes and no. I mean, you know, as a, as a science fiction scholar, I've certainly made my fair use of Darko Suvin um as well and and that idea of cognitive estrangement and there is something really intellectually helpful about the way that he frames it and this idea of the familiar made strange and the strange made familiar i think is 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 really part of where the appeal of the genre comes from for a lot of people even if maybe they can't articulate it in uh souvenian um ways but in reality, though, when I come back to a personal definition of science fiction for me and, and what I am finding that I am engaging with personally and, and enjoying and, and getting the most from, I, I can't get away from the most broad um, definition, which in some ways is is not very helpful, but is also the one that you can always fall back on to justify any argument you ever need to have about whether anything is science fiction. Um, and that's by Damon Knight um, in 1952. And, and he, it's, it's, the exact quote isn't as pithy, but it's normally paraphrased as um, science fiction is what we point to when we say science fiction. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to go through a few examples today of things that are marketed as science fiction, but some fans might not think they are, or that the fans embrace as science fiction, but the scholars would disagree, or that, you know, we can read as science fiction. I'm a big fan of reading things. And by reading, I mean, in the kind of critical sense. So also viewing films, playing games, enjoying lawn art, whatever it might be, um, uh, and interpreting it as science fiction, you know, um, engaging with it as science fiction, whether it was meant to be or not. Um, Reading a political manifesto as a work of science fiction is a really interesting uh, exercise, for example, um, because it's a way of shaping Ooh, the future. Oh, that sounds fascinating. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah that so very I'm a big fan of reading things that aren't science fiction, pointing them at them and saying, that's science fiction now. Um, so th it's all a way of saying that really um, the, the genre is boundaryless. Um, Acts of genre are acts of putting boundaries on things, you know, like so that you know what shelf to put it on in a bookshop or which um, Im imprint to publish your book in or or which um, film studio is most likely to take your film or which director is going to work on it or whatever. Um, you know, that's a, to a certain extent that it's genre is all about creating boundaries. But science fiction constantly resists those boundaries and is constantly like pushing beyond them um, in a way that I don't think any other genre does um i mean um, you can make a case for all sorts of others i suppose but but you know crime for example is much more easily defined as a certain set of plots and character types and and the setting changes and and you know there are evolutions in crime narratives but it's not that as broad and spidery as science fiction and i think it's telling that you can have a science fiction crime narrative like science fiction can very easily swallow up other genres like crime and romance and humor and horror um but horror doesn't easily swallow up other you know doesn't necessarily work the other way so um mm. so for me science fiction is this massive broad sprawling thing and so i often find it easier to just point to something and say that's science fiction for me um and do it on a kind of case by case basis which is not very helpful if you're trying to like make a proper definition i'm going to say i do i do get the point of of enjoying that because in large part when i when i do do this podcast it is going to be ultimately my opinion and i will sometimes be pointing to things and going i don't want to do that so i'm going to be like it's not science fiction and at other times when i want to want to look at a film i'll be like yeah that's that's science fiction the thing you said about um manifestos is fascinating though i'm going to try and look <laughs> 
This week, I'm going to try and look at lots of other things that could be science fiction if we just looked at them a different way. Um, yeah. Did, did you want to continue on your point there? Yeah. So at the same time as like, you know, this, I have this personal um, uh, resistance to a clean definition, I suppose. Um, at the same time, when doing something like the exhibition for the Science Museum, we obviously did need to have some sort of rationale for what's in, what's out, what are we including, what aren't we including. And for that exhibition, you know, it was at the Science Museum. So there was a different level of um, uh, criteria that we were meeting for something that had something interesting to say on a scientific level. And so in that respect, we were coming closer to something perhaps a little bit like um, a really lovely definition, actually, by uh, Ray Bradbury. Um, from again, um, 1950s, 1953. And he says that science fiction is, after all, the fiction of ideas, the fiction where philosophy can be tinkered with, torn apart, put back together again. It's the fiction of sociology and psychology and history compounded and squared by time. It is the fiction where you may set up and knock down your own political and religious and moral states. And that's a really lovely, like Bradbury, Bradbury-esque, you know, master of the of, of language and craft. But what he's essentially saying is that science fiction is a laboratory of the mind where you can run experiments and then, um, you know, analyze the results through fiction. And that, as a as a motif, is really valuable um, for me and as a curator in a science museum to justify the presence of science fiction. And so. Mm. With the the objects that we were looking at and the films, the books, the artworks, the video games that were in that exhibition, it was about um, going back to them and saying, well, what what questions are being asked of them in this laboratory of the mind? And and if the question, if they didn't really fit into that model, then they were a lot harder to justify including and often wouldn't have been included. So, so you know, I we have different definitions depending on what we want to do with the genre as well, you know. That's a great start. Thank you for that, guys. I think we've talked a lot about what science fiction is. And now I want to go into the far more controversial side of what science, uh, science fiction isn't. Um, I actually put up a, a poll on a Facebook group a while ago, which was trying to look at whether superhero films were science fiction, because I'm on a few science fiction groups um, online and often they'll come up with some superhero films or superhero comics and they'll, you know, they'll be included in the science fiction genre. I find that quite difficult because I can kind of see the point. Um, but at the same time, to me, they are 100% not science fiction. Um, but let's start with your opinions on superhero films. What do you make of them? Are they science fiction? Are they something else? What else are they? I think we're talking about a very broad category of film. Um, I think some superhero films feel like they could be science fiction to me. I mean, um, I know that we're going to discuss uh, Star Wars um, as well in this, uh, in this list of examples, but Guardians of the Galaxy feels as much like science fiction um, as Star Wars does to me. Um, and something like Iron Man, um, it's relatively grounded um, in that respect and has like a technological novum, which um, Suvin might have approved of, although he probably wouldn't have approved of the uh, billionaire um, industrialist being the hero. But, the, you know, and um, uh, the mo most recent Batman film to, to show my um, DC Marvel um, breadth, um, the most recent Batman film with Robert Pattinson felt very grounded and, and um, more like a crime noir um, rather than science fiction, perhaps. Um, whereas something like Doctor Strange, which actively includes magic, um, is much harder to kind of um, justify including. So I think superhero films is quite a big tent um, to dismiss or include um, in one fell swoop, personally. But um, yeah, as ever, I don't like neat answers to anything. So it's always, always just pick over the corpse of the question. Yeah, just since you mentioned magic, which we, I think we'll go on to after Lisa tells me about why they're not superhero, uh, why they're not science fiction, because I don't want to include them, even though I love superhero films. Um, what about something like Thor? Because that's magic to us, but it's a very advanced form of science in theory. Yeah, well, you knock up straight away against Clark's third law, which is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And once you absorb that um, 
uh, rule into your kind of tool set of what is and isn't science fiction. There are no boundaries. You can just say everything's science fiction now. I mean, why why might we consider um, Mithril to be a fantasy um, material, um, a super hard metal of undefined properties that does whatever Tolkien needs it to do? Um, but Unobtainium, which is a much stupider name, um, is like, you know, the key material in something like Avatar, which most people would say is a science fiction film. So it's, we're very inconsistent about how we apply these, uh, rules, um, as a culture, which is why, again, we just come back to choose what you want, point to it and include it, and don't worry too much about the, anyone else's <laughs> rules and opinions is my, my guiding principle. Lisa. Bring some so, sense. <laughs> uh, well, let me try to provide some historical context, which I fear is actually only going to make things more complicated for you and sort of uh, expand on, on where Glenn started here. Um, you know, I, I think that Glenn's absolutely right. Comics uh, and, and superheroes in general are like science fiction. It's a big tent. And there are lots of different strains of, of the storytelling and some of them absolutely feel like they ally themselves with the way we think about science fiction, especially in its more commercial strains. And that makes sense because a lot of early commercial science fiction authors were writing what we would now call superhero or comic book stories and went on to help found that community. So, for instance, you know, the first lab grown superhero was imagined by Francis Stevens. That's the pen name of Gertrude Barrows Bennett in 1903, 1904 in the curious experience of Thomas Dunbar. And it's, it's very much a straight up, very science fictional, like depiction of labs and uh, chemicals and elements. And then, of course, you have the fantastic moment that they discover uh, Stellarite in this case, and it transforms someone into a superhero. Um, but right, science fiction is always about breaking the science. So there you go. Uh, and, but I feel like a story like that, you know, I mean, it's a short jump from that to Wolverine, frankly. And that feels, again, that's a science fiction superhero character or a character, science fiction comic book character who feels science fictional. Sorry. And then, of course, later, um, you know, you had pretty famous early pulp science fiction authors like Edmund Hamilton, who were famous for writing these larger than life uh, space operas with huge battles and like, big struggles between humans and aliens. And just as science fiction started to maybe move a little bit past that mode of storytelling, he shifted over and became one of the key uh, storytellers in the early comic book community. So you really do get a lot of back and forth like that. So I'm afraid there is no simple way to separate these things, right? And then even today, you have authors I mean, what about people working on Black Panther, magic or science, right? Like in theory, we think about, uh, ver uh, was it vibranium as being a sort of, as an element and there's a sort of scientific basis for this. But, you know, the whole Wakanda vibranium thing started out as a joke, right? Like every time they needed to explain a super technology in the Marvel universe, they're like, well, it comes from Wakanda. And, 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 and so, you know, eventually it builds out into a, a more interesting and serious story, but um, I just don't think there's a very clear line here. It's, it's where we want to draw it. So the latest um, in the poll that I, that I asked, it had over 150, well, no, it had 155 votes and we had only 14% for yes. 29% um, firmly said no. Um, and then 57% said depends on other elements in the story. Um, there were people who were very strongly saying that superhero stories follow along with kind of like mythical heroes. And so although we might ground them in science, what it's talking about um, doesn't relate back to science fiction. For me, and again, I've, I've read so many definitions and I don't know if I can find one a bit like you, Glenn. I, I, I feel it in my heart more than anything else. Um, when I read or watch a science fiction film, I think very often it is to do with humanity as a whole. Um, whereas I think with a superhero film, it's, it's kind of, it's when I was a kid and even to this day, when I watch a superhero film, I want to be the superhero. And it doesn't really tell me about the society that we're living in and, and what that says about us. I think that's a great point. I tend to think about science fiction as storytelling about institutions and groups, right? This is, it, it, it verges on being a sort of collective mode of storytelling, whereas what you're saying, suggesting is superhero stories really default back to the individual. Is, is that sort of what I'm Yeah, I'm maybe. Getting? I think that's what I'm saying. I might find yeah. out by the end of the show. 
I think there's some truth in that, perhaps. But um, the as with everything, there's always an exception. And for me, like something like the X Men stories, you know, where the, that was always from the beginning interwoven with stories about discrimination and minority communities. And so though that story of mutants, um, especially against the backdrop of, you know, um, uh, segregation and civil rights and, and later the AIDS crisis and, and things like that, um, those feel very much like they would fit within mm. your kind of definition. So there's always, there's always exceptions. I mean, certainly those early DC comics are very mythic and, and I think it's why they struggled to translate them to film um, early on is because they are larger than life kind of myth level characters, literally in the case of someone like Wonder Woman. Um, whereas Marvel, who were, came along later, there, a lot of theirs are weird science, you know, like scientist, like Bruce Banner, science gets um, irradiated blood and becomes the Hulk, like they, they which is Jekyll and Hyde, right? Yeah. In, in superhero form, which we Absolutely. would say perhaps is science fiction. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's messy. It's a messy world. It is. We, oh, I just, can I jump in really quick? I, yes. I think it's interesting that you pull X-Men out as an example, because I know uh, David Hartwell's talked about this, and I certainly agree with him based on my own research. And this is, he really thinks that a lot of those X-Men stories were inspired by the sort of super children and slant stories that especially women like Wilmar Sharas were writing and publishing and uh, Zena Henderson in in the in the magazines of the 40s and 50s so the fact that you would feel a sort yeah. of a, a tighter connection between the x-men stories and what we tend to think of as science fiction i think that makes a certain amount of sense because it's a it's a it's a it's narrative that would that. have been out there and absolutely part of speculative storytelling culture in america at that time mm. very interesting thank you um You've already gone in with the with the Arthur C. Clarke quote about magic and technology. So that there is there tends to be a, and I'm seeing it more and more. I'm watching the Foundation series currently, um, and this thing of science versus mysticism, mm. and it, you know it, it's in Star Wars, um, it's in Dune, which I don't know many people who who would kind of write it off. But I think there's an element where some sometimes when you go into magic, as you said. Um, it kind of goes, well, well, that's not science, and therefore it isn't science fiction. What do you think about those things? Lisa, let's start with you. The trick, right, is is that sometimes what we call religion or magic, it, it, it is a science It's a, or a techne, right, in that Greek sense of a methodical way of knowing the world and, and manipulating the world. And so, you know, I do like the Arthur C. Clarke quote, and again, I think the other way I think about this, especially in my work in the in the discovery of new voices in science fiction, are all these marvelous authors around the world who are pushing back at our ideas about what constitutes science or technology or magic. So uh, I, I think it's it's you know I, important that we're aware of that. Having said that, you're like just to go back to the Doctor Strange versus Iron Man thing, there are some kinds of magic that are clearly magic. It's not technology having been repackaged as magic. But can you have, so I think there is some room for magic within science fictional explorations. Uh, I think there's a lot of great work that's coming, for instance, out of uh, African, uh, across Africa right now by authors who are really asking us to think about like, why can't you have uh, what we would call magic and science existing in the same world? Like where, where exactly is the problem with this? So I personally am down with some magic in my science fiction for sure. But again, I feel like I want it to tie back to this concept of techne and that I want it to be somehow a methodical way of observing and working with and changing the world. Are either of you watching the foundation series? Yeah. Or have watched it? Yeah. And so in that it, it is, like the fact it's it's kind of put up against each other as as um you know on one side you have this kind of psycho history and you can predict the future and it's it's all science and hard very very advanced science and on the other hand you have you know this this innate sense of understanding the world um which is on the mystical side of things and yet there's always this hint that they're both entwined so so it kind of always goes back to the arthur c clark um quote so it is interesting that you know it, and and again that's about humanity like that's how people are like you get people who are, who are very very you know ingrained in science and they and they don't you know they won't be open to anything that's a little bit mystical and there are people who who trust yeah. the universe and all those kind of things so again it goes back to how we are um 
But it's well, interesting to think that they might be linked at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can look at Star Wars as an illustration of this, right? So Star Wars, we could write off as not being science fiction and just say it's wizards in space. Like, no, it's not science fiction. What's the force? It's humbo jumbo, like magical mystery stuff. But then they reverse engineer a very science fictional explanation for the force in the form of midichlorians in the prequels. And that's one of the most hated elements of the Star Wars mythos. So by trying to make it more science fictional, they undermine something about what people loved about Star Wars. And you don't hear mm. that midichlorians are not a big part of what is just part of the Star Wars universe going forward. So I think that's actually really interesting because it shows that, you know, that there is this capacity for that more fantastical mystery of the force that it, it's not, it's never called a form of magic, um, except disparagingly, um, by, you know, a Han Solo type character. Um, but it's, ne it's, it's always, understood that it requires learning and study to become a master of this discipline so that it's a type of knowledge that's inaccessible to the people that are not schooled in it. Um, so there is something there, I think. And I think Lisa's point about um, African science fiction producing a lot of really good examples of this, um, I think actually it's true of a lot of global um, genres. So Chinese science fiction as well, it's no coincidence that the first breakthrough novel into the West of Chinese science fiction was The Three-Body Problem, which is the most hard science fiction. He's, he's an engineer. It's very like, it feel it reads very like a Western science fiction book. It's very rules, science, engineering, solid. Whereas a lot of the stuff that he's, um, Xi Xin Liu has opened the door for and has come through since, it has a lot more spirituality and seems from what I know of Chinese science fiction is more true of what the genre is over there has more kind of ancestor, um, um, ancestor magic for lack of a better word, um, spirituality, um, like wisdom in different forms and is, is much weirder and stranger to us as, as Western readers. So it's all over. And I think actually, um, we are, are used to a very narrow, slice of science fiction and and one of the great things about the 21st century is that we are all broadening our horizons and the genre a lot more because I, I quite like reading um magic realism and what i like about that is i come from a culture and you know south america is a culture where that spirit realm is just taken as fact yes. it's not something that's questioned as oh it's weird stuff that's over there it's just you know your ancestors or whatever it is and you've got like spirits and and so if you were going to make science fiction and all of those things were taken for granted, you'd be writing science fiction with that kind of magical element. Yeah. The interesting yeah. thing, right? Because you see it very locally as well. Like this is very true of indigenous science fictions across the globe, both in the US and just about anywhere else. Um, and even now we have a movement in Atlanta here in Georgia in the US and it's called Atlanta Futurism. And it is in dialogue with a lot of the other black futurisms that are happening. But again, there's this sort of interesting embrace of technology and magic and like stories about like the magic of metals that have been run over on highways a million time and things. And this is fascinating merging of these things that is Sorry, the anything, magic making of, me of feel metals like that have been run over, Can run over a that? million times. Yeah. Like it's this amazing story about homeless people collecting the metals off the highway because they can do magic with them because when that much energy has been pounded into a piece of metal, it uh, it becomes so something that can humans, act back on the world. Yeah, see, Very mind blowing, super cool stuff. Yes. Very clever. I like that. There's also a lot of stuff about mistletoe in that story, and I now every time I walk around the city, I, I see mistletoe everywhere, and I'd never seen it before. So, you know, a so I, experience, I, if maybe, anything, Lisa? pardon, <laughs> yeah, it's for real, yeah. <laughs> for real. Although then my husband uh, pointed out that mistletoe only grows on trees when they're dying, and because mistletoe are parasites and is a, is a parasite. So that <laughs> that took me right back into the land of science and science it's the fiction. The romance um, of mistletoe, yeah. <laughs> that's the cool thing, though, right? Look at how all this stuff sort of just blends together, and and you you had that that sort of that mind blow moment that I feel like is one of the characteristics of science fiction, right? Go back to Damon Knight, that idea of a sense of wonder right? Mm. And that you suddenly see the world differently. And yeah. I think that that's cool. And I think it's important to like, to just contextualize this for, for anyone who takes that more like, yes, yes, but science, science is definitive known facts. Well, but science is expanding its knowledge of the, you know, the indigenous knowledges, for example, um, 
have scientific rationales and, and basis, even within our Western rational scientific thought that we didn't know were there. So for example, the idea that, you know, all of the forest is talking to itself and, and communicating would have been written off as like hippy dippy nonsense at one point. And now actually we know that mycelial networks are connecting all of these trees and they're sending messages out saying, look out, there's a parasite. I'm being attacked by a parasite. And then trees further down the network start producing these like and, um, venoms to um, protect themselves and all this sort of stuff. And there's science fiction that's based on that. So now coming through, there's a lot of forest-based science fiction at the moment. It's really having a moment. Um, SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, have done some amazing work about the language of whales um, and the kind of um, the the ways in which um, uh, ocean life communicates um, that we you know would never previously have understood. And uh, Lawrence Rees, one of the scientists who's been doing a lot of that research for SETI. And who um, discovered one of the first exoplanets? Actually, so he's like a he's an astronomer who has now turned to the oceans. Um, he uh, talks about his indebtedness to indigenous knowledges because indigenous people in the Californian coast always knew that uh, whales and dolphins talked to each other, but uh, we have only been able to kind of been aware of that more recently since basically since submarines were invented because um, we've never paid them any attention in that sort of way. It, it just shows that even science is evolving and becoming more worldly in its view. So the fact that science fiction is doing this as well um, is not an accident. Yeah. And I just wanna complicate that even further that I don't think it's just today. There are historical examples. You can, I mean, well, obviously the history of science is the history yeah. of learning that facts are not facts. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Yeah. Um, but to give a really concrete example, uh, in America, in colonial America, uh, people bought almanacs because you had to figure out the tide tables, like when the tides were going to come in and out because so much shipping and farming depended on that. And everyone always talks about, <laughs> I'm losing the name of the famous American who wrote uh, almanacs. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. But the reality was he wasn't the best-selling almanac author. The best-selling almanac author was a black scientist, a freed black man named ben Benjamin Banneker, who actually was combining his uh, dad was from the Dogen tribe in Africa. And the Dogen have a very extensive knowledge of uh, star systems and a very extensive set of cosmologies about them. And then he was, his dad was brought over as a slave and then freed, married a white woman. They sent their kid to a Quaker school, but the mom also made sure that her son learned the Dogen astro astronomy um, systems. And when Banneker grew up, his tide tables were more accurate than anyone else's. And he still had the best selling almanacs in colonial America. And it was because he was combining Western and indigenous knowledges in ways that simply worked better than any kind of just Western knowledge alone. Oh, wow. And he put all that money into the abolitionist movement. So good on Benjamin Banneker. He was a cool guy. That, yeah, that's a cool Benjamin right there. Um, <laughs> okay. Since you mentioned aliens, we're going to segue very conveniently to... Pigs Pigs in space. space! And the question is, can you put anything into space and does that make it science fiction? Glyn. Um, well, I mean, I guess case in point, Wizards in Space, Star Wars, you know, it certainly seems to be um, that space is, is the dominant um, uh, place for science fiction to happen in the public imagination anyway. And actually this even comes back to the feedback we got um, from visitors for the exhibition. So. You know, we we one of our key objectives was to show people that science fiction is more than just space, and I think we achieved that. We had lots of stories about climate change and AI and and um, cyborgism and all of this other stuff. Um, but then when we got the visitor feedback, they were disappointed whenever it wasn't stuff that was to do with space. <laughs> so you know, we achieved our aim, but at the price of maybe some visitor satisfaction. Um, space is just so. Um, I don't know. Let me let me start that thought again. Space is the area where our imagination can still be limitless, I think. Um I think there's there's something interesting in the history of imaginative literature of like you know the 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 um speculative stories, what we might call proto-science fiction or or fantasy or utopian literature or whatever is happening in the the here be dragons areas of the map like the uncharted territories and as those get pushed further and further out and we map all of earth then space is all that is the only place that's left 
for these kind of flights of fancy to happen. And I think that's the, one of the reasons why, you know, we're so drawn to it because um, we can all imagine, you know, what's beyond the, the final frontier. Um, and you even see it in the history of science fiction. So, um, you know, there were, there were loads, of, loads of science fiction about Mars being home to another civilization, um, often one that's older than ours and, and you know, um, has its own problems and, and whatever. But um, as soon as uh, NASA got telemetry that showed that actually it was a barren um, desert, that kind of fiction basically stopped. And it took Mars, Mars fiction a while to come back around until you get to the more kind of um, the Martian and Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars and that kind of um, technocratic Mars fiction, I guess, um, that's kind of replaced it. But the idea of, you know, indigenous Martians w wandering around now is seen as hokey and, and kind of retro. Um, so the boundary has been pushed out further. Um, and, you know, we have to go to planets beyond our solar system for those sorts of stories. But but yeah. yeah, I was doing some research for, for so the next episode um, is about um, Voyage to the Moon. And in that, they talk about how, you know, there was the presumption that there would be, there would be life on the moon. And then, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, mid 1800s, they'd kind of figured out that, that that wasn't possible. And there were still a few kind of, you know, people were still, because it had become a theme. Um, but like, you would never have that now. You would never have like, oh, there are people walking around on the moon. No. And you think about it, right? Science fiction gets really popular uh, right literally in the same decade that the American West is officially called closed and the Earth is officially explored, right? Um, and I think that that's no surprise, right? As Glenn is saying, we have to push our boundaries out further. It was always the West, the West, the West. I mean, that's key to the American Jeremiah. It's key, key to a lot of Christian sort of storytelling traditions, right? The promise of the West. Um, and then once the West is settled, yeah, you have to go to space. What's interesting to me, of course, is that we we have another space on Earth that we haven't explored at all, of course, and that's underwater, right? And if anything, we know less about undersea uh, aquatic environments on Earth than we do about certain parts of outer space. And early science fiction did do a lot of underwater stories, obviously, as much as outer space stories. Jules Verne would take you wherever, right? Um but that's not a story type that really hung on. We really lost mm. underwater stories. Um, I, I, I wonder if it's not in part because we came from the ocean, so it doesn't, you know, right? If you think about evolutionary narratives, so that feels like going back mm. rather than forward. But also the reality is uh, the, the turn of the last century marked the end of, uh, of the great maritime economies. So maybe that's just, and the beginning of uh, flight-based economies. So maybe that's part of where this appeal comes from. Or at least the occlusion of maritime economies. That it's all it's all still yeah. there. It's just hidden. Yeah. We forget. Of course. Container ships. Yes. It's not sexy. No, but they come back, right? And they come back in dystopias like Ready Player One, where everyone lives in a container box mm. like yeah. that. Yeah. Well and and so do ocean stories. But yes, that's the you're thing. Right. Good ocean point. stories yes. have kind of had a slight resurgence yes. for the mm -hmm. um kind of idea of um you know, a billionaire setting up an underwater city where in, in international waters where they're exempt from, from r the rules of any other nation and can do what they want. So that kind of Bioshock, um, kind of tale. There's a little bit more of that kind of thing starting to come, but it notably even that has yeah. a kind of retro, um, element to it. So they're, they're always drawing on the past rather than the future. So you're right. We are seeing, it's interesting, a sort of new interest in, I just did the Ocean Visions conference actually last year because people were excited to learn about ocean-based science fiction. That's, it's really interesting to me because to me, going into space seems really appealing. Like if a spaceship dropped off, I'd be like, maybe. But going to the deep, dark depths of the ocean, to me, is absolutely terrifying. And it's, and it's strange because you can't breathe in either. Um, yeah, they're both but, yeah. environments that are trying to kill you. Like, yeah. Yes. Moving on from space, let's go on a bit more to these common themes that we have and how they relate to our understandings of ourselves, of humanity, what they mean, what they represent. And if we're going into space, we come across a lot of aliens. So what are the themes around aliens? What do they tend to represent? And what are they telling us ultimately about us? Because that's what I think it always ends up being about. 
Well, I think in early science fiction, alien others are usually the equivalent of our indigenous others on Earth, right? I mean, science fiction narratives grow up at the same time as uh, colonial narratives and also sort of these new scientific, uh, like Darwinian kind of uh, voyages and narratives that come out of that. So, right, and you can see this in, I, I know you're doing a trip to the moon next week, but um, it, it seems to me that aliens early on, right, they represent the other on Earth, um, and it's specifically the other to, to white Western, Euro-Western peoples. I'd say okay. that's true. I think they also represent the other in ourselves. Like, they're often about, like, the psyche and kind of exploring the otherness um, in that respect as well. Um the alien and the monster and and you know w w all of those others um are often just proxies for science fiction to talk about a different issue whether consciously or not like that's that's normally what's going on there are very few aliens that feel truly alien you know that feel like they haven't come out of earth in some way which makes sense right because they're all the product of human imagination so the, by definition, they have come out of Earth in some way. And the ones that excite me the most are the ones that do feel truly strange. So I'm a big fan of Sanazor Lem's Solaris, for example, which is all about the unknowability of that alien, like because it's so alien and strange that we can't ever know it truly. Um, and that, I, that's, there's something really appealing in that to me, um, as, as a depiction of the alien. But, you know, the vast majority of aliens in science fiction, I would imagine without having done an actual survey are much more um you know familiar um whether it's uh pointy ears um and cornish pasties on the forehead um in star trek or you know green skin or even things that are more strange there's something that we can still imagine fighting a war with or um building a federation with or you know trading with or you know the the these kind of narratives um proliferate and they're all different sections of us even when they're monsters you know go back to perhaps the first science fiction monster frankenstein um depending on how you want to define the genre that also affects where you say it starts but frankenstein is often you know um quite persuasively put forward as as one of the first science fiction novels and Mary Shelley writes this book in 1818. Um, but if you know, uh, we think about the film, um, since that's the topic of your of your of your show, um, the James Whale adaptation with Boris Karloff in 1931. There's this mo like really touching moment where um, you know the monster is um, throwing flowers into the into the water with with a little girl, and he's not scared, she's not scared, but he doesn't understand and it all goes horribly wrong. You can discuss um, uh, an appropriate time, but there's this element in there of the fact that the, he's not just to be written off as a monster. That's what makes it a science fiction is that he's some element of ourselves that there's, there's something in there about like nurture and the fact that he's just not been taught properly. And, you know, it's, I love reading science fiction as being a parable of bad parenting rather than about like, the hubris of the scientist or whatever um like there's nothing inherently wrong with what dr frankenstein did um it's that he freaked out and abandoned the monster rather than actually like stood stood there and dealt with the implications of his discovery um for example so he's he's a bad dad <laughs> yeah he's a bad dad yeah yes. it's all about bad dads yes is there a, a difference in the way aliens and monsters are depicted because when i think about them aliens do tend to be there is more of that the other whereas with monsters it it kind of comes back to you know the cliche of who's the real monster like there, there's something about it's it feels like a different theme to me is that often the case to answer in a sideways way, I often feel aliens and like technological beings like robots and AIs are depicted in similar ways, but monsters feel different uh, in some way to me. In part, I think because the thing that's the alien or the robot is in theory value neutral and you can project a lot onto it, but we have a lot of cultural baggage with the word monster that tends to predispose us to read monsters in a very certain way. Having said that, 
It is from the Latin word monstrare, which means to point to or demonstrate something, right? So there's nothing inherently that it has to be bad. It's that the monster points out something to us. And that feels like it takes us back to that kind of ambivalence and that openness that can be so productive in science fiction. Because you're mm. right, um, we often get uh, movies or books where it, though you learn that you're the real monster. Uh, it's not the monsters you've been fighting, for instance. You've talked about robots and, and AI. I think when we get to that, often what tends to happen is, is it, it goes inward almost. Like, you know, what is it to be human? What, what is consciousness? What is sentience? And, and I believe I'm sentient. Um, and then the thought that maybe it's not, maybe it is just, you know, you're genetically coded, which is kind of like programming. Um, and you put that all together and you could easily program a robot to think it's sentient, which is ultimately what we're doing. Yeah. Well, Richard Dawkins, right, explored this in The Selfish Gene, where he argued that humans are nothing but great lumbering flesh robots that are being directed by genes, which give us the illusion of consciousness and free will so that we do their bidding, essentially. Um, yeah. Biology science, generally... science fiction, you tell me. That's another <laughs> thing, Glenn, right? Reading science as science fiction, right, as well as political manifestos. You can do that a lot, too. The scientists hate it, but it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that we don't have free will. And that is such a huge glitch in our understanding of our ourselves. Because I think I think very often there is there is a kind of a cliche of fe fembots, I think we'll call them from, from Austin Powers, but you know, women as robots. And that's a theme that comes over and over and over again. Um I absolutely adore the way it was kind of twisted on its head in Ex Machina, which I really felt kind of spoke to all the previous iterations of, you know, because that the women always tend to be kind of of the male gaze and, and kind of mm -hmm. perfect. Um, can you talk a bit about, yeah, about female representation as robots, Lisa? I know that this might be your field. I, I, I've, I've talked about it a bit in the past. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Ex Machina is a great example right there because I, the, the message seems so brilliantly clear to me. And yet it's so odd to me that people miss it, which is that when you abuse your creations, they're going to fight back and treat you the exact same way. Uh, this is also the theme of Naomi Alderman's The Power, uh, which was a novel that came out a few years ago and I believe is under production right now. Um, as a probably streaming serial, I'm going to guess. I can't imagine Hollywood be bra would be brave enough to take the movie on um, or the book on, right? Um, and that's about, right, what if women suddenly got um, the ability to uh, shoot electricity out of their fingers and were so immediately the more powerful of the two sexes? But I, I think that this idea that when you abuse your creations, they push back. Of course, that goes all the way back to Frankenstein. Women have been telling you this for several hundred years now, that when they are uh, ignored and uh, sidelined, um, that's going to result in the death of everything, <laughs> for one thing, right? Uh, but also in creations that fight back against you eventually. And I think it's so refreshing in Ex Machina, not only to see the pushback against fembots, but also against the idea of like the tragic creation who's going to just disappear into the wilderness and and die. But I, I, I like that those women or the robots fight back. See, and I want to call them women. I want to give them like subjectivity and agency. You know, we're right. Like more often than not, when women are elided with robots, uh, it's either to show how robots will be ideal domestics or how women are easily programmable, I think. Um, so uh, it, it can play that way. It doesn't have to. But I think, you know, we go all the way back to Metropolis, for instance, which brings obviously issues of gender and issues of reproduced or of labor together, uh, productive and reproductive labor actually really clash in that particular movie. Uh, and maybe that's it from the beginning is that robots are meant to do the productive labor that humans don't want to do. And let's be honest, women are often defined by a set of reproductive labors that some love and totally lean into, but others don't necessarily want to do. And certainly you haven't seen any men stepping up to take over that particular job, right? We can build so something that will do it. maybe that's where the link is. <laughs> yeah, so I'm wondering if maybe that's where the link is somewhere in these yeah. links between productive and reproductive labor. Yeah, well, the first, the word robot comes from um, science fiction. You know, it comes from uh, yeah. the Czech writer, um, Carol Chapek's R.U.R. 
um, in 1920. 20. Yeah, 20. And, um, you know, that's very interested in class-based struggle and, and the worker uprising in that respect. But it's, you know, as Lisa says, it, it's not a, it's not a massive cognitive leap to kind of take that kind of the worker as a group and then think of the worker in the home, um, in, in the form of, of women. And, and yeah, the feminization of robots and gynoids, um, is definitely something that, uh, has been a trope of the genre for a very long time. And the two come together at the end of RUR, right? Because mm. the robots have never had access. They can't reproduce themselves because they never have had access to the scientific formula to create robots. And now all the humans are dead. But they're very lucky because somehow two of the robots fall in love and it's implied that they're going to be able to reproduce. So it's interesting how those kinds of labor literally collapse at the end of that particular uh, uh, play. Mm. Love conquers all. <laughs> yeah, magic. Um, <laughs> going yes, back to magic exactly. Again. Right, it takes yeah. us right back to magic. Yeah, yeah. And, and Hollywood's and it's favorite theme. Let us explain a very complicated scientific and social situation, which we will solve by two people falling in love. Easy way out. Um, yeah. Let's talk about something that has really, really proliferated in the last five to ten years, which is time travel. Um, We've got time travel, we've got multiverses upon multiverses. It used to be rare and exciting, and it's almost like I expect it in, in the majority of films I watch now. What is it telling us about us? Why is it so common in, in science fiction? So in one respect, it links very nicely from what we were just talking about, because one type of time travel story is very interested in free will and the idea that you know, you can, you can't change the past, that, that everything is set in stone and you might, you might travel down to the past and do something, but it turns out you'd always done that thing and it was always meant to be. And that kind of then draws a lot of questions about, well, you know, are we, do we have free will? What does sentience mean? So we come back to a lot of the themes and questions we were discussing with AI and robots. I guess part of the appeal is that you don't have to do it that way. And so you can change the past and have branching timelines and, and different um, versions of the future or alternate presents or alternate histories. Um, and so maybe that in itself is also saying something about free will. It's a, it's a, um, it, it's the, those stories advocating for free will and the human, um, capacity, often the individual's capacity to make real change in the world. Um, and I've, I've studied and written quite a bit about alternate history, which is a very, you know, in some ways is a completely separate genre to science fiction, which overlaps repeatedly. It has its own roots. It has its own definitions, its own set of problems. And yet also is, um, very enmeshed with science fiction. Um, a lot of the time, particularly in the 20th century and 20 and now. Um, but the, that genre is very interested in you know, what might have been. It's asking that same what if question that science fiction is asking. And much like science fiction, because fantasy also says what if fairies were real or, or whatever. But science, um, alternate history, I think of as being kin to science fiction um, in that it, it asks that question in a very methodical um, way. So it, it meticulously builds out from that. What if Hitler won World War II, the, the mm. most common scenario um, in an alternate history story. Um, okay, so here are the series of changes that would happen and here are the different implications. My story is set in 1965, so this would have happened and this would have happened. And, and it, it, there's something very like um, scientific <laughs> about that kind of process. So I can see why science and science fiction and alternate history kind of interact in that way. But yeah, I think that for me, T uh, time travel alternate history stories are about that very human um, wonder of what if things had happened differently and about that branching path. And I think they're the type of stories that I am most excited by. But every time, every now and again, I see one like um, history can't be changed. There is no free will. Like you had always gone back in time and done this thing. And those are often very clever, especially in film. Um, and will blow my mind and, and I'll give you a completely different answer. So can you name one of your favorites in that genre? No, <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> That's fine. no, interstellar is oh. probably a really good one. Um, 
that I think is a really great film that because it it's blending a lot of different interests. You know, the the idea of relative time and and space flight and a an ecological crisis on Earth. Like, there's so many themes in there, but it's time travel story is that kind of fixed points in time. What had happened had always been what happened. Um, and Nolan deals with that really well as a kind of mystery that he unpacks for you. Um, and that's when that kind of story is at its most rewarding, I think. Um, which is hard to do because by definition, you know, what's going to happen. Like, mm. you know, that they, they can't change time. So it had to always be the way it was. Um, but it takes a certain skill of a storyteller to be able to, keep that kind of narrative engaging i think absolutely i just wanted to touch upon my one of my favorite genres which is dystopia but i just before i do that i'm going to read a, a quick another arthur c Clarke quote which is his definition science fiction is something that could happen but you usually wouldn't want it to um fantasy is something that couldn't happen that you often only wish that it could um and it went back to i i remember speaking to lisa where you said that the a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away kind of instantly makes Star Wars into the fantasy realm. But that quote by Arthur C. Clarke is also, you know, we, we want to be in space fighting, um, you know, Siths, or at least I do. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so it, whereas when we go into dystopia, that feels like a solid, um, you know, solid kind of sci- sci-fi theme in which, you know, it's it repeats over and over again. We don't tend to see a lot of utopia, even though sometimes I think maybe we could try and see it from a different perspective. Maybe if you are the authoritarian regime or whoever it is, it's it's actually quite a nice place <laughs> to be in. Um, why is science fiction so fixated on all the things that could go wrong and everything that could be exploited? So. I actually think there is more utopia. First of all, I just want to say this is that there, I think, is a range of stances. And I think that we're actually increasingly seeing, if not utopian science fiction, at least what I like to call like newtopian science fiction, people thinking out past dystopia towards better futures, what we're now calling hope punk. And science fiction has actually long been utopian and even techno optimistic, I would say. But that tradition resides primarily in print and uh, low-cost publishing forms. Uh, Susan Sontag covered this in The Imagination of Catastrophe back in the 1960s, 70s. Yeah, so just just to add, um, like, if if you start reading about what science fiction is, it's it's one of the essays that comes up over and over again. Um, It's really readable to this day, and it's definitely worth a look. I will add that into the show notes. And the point that Sontag makes, of course, is that most of what we call science fiction that's coming out of Hollywood, and I think we can say this a lot for a lot of TV and some streaming science fiction now these days as well, isn't really science fiction. It's either dystopian or disaster fiction, right? Um, Because that's really what's foregrounded is the spectacle of the disaster, Uh, because that's what visual media can do really well. It's exciting to see New York taken apart or to see a whole world blown apart. And it's really boring to watch a bunch of people stand around and plan to make a better society. It's tough to make that visually compelling unless you've got the utopia planners fighting all the dystopian threats to their utopia. Uh, that's, that's the one way you can do that is have it be a utopia under threat. We've seen that in the Wakanda movies, for instance, right? Uh, in the Black Panther movies to a certain extent. So. Uh, I so I do think thing, there's more dystopia visually. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, so, I, I think when I think dystopia, I don't think of the the blowing up of things. I think of things like a hands a Handmaid's Tale and oh, fair enough. Okay, I'm conflating dystopia and um, disaster here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, fair 1984, enough. where where it's you know things have gotten very oppressive. There is an authority you. you know authoritarian yeah. regime, and it's always making commentary on you know the systems that we have in place now. Why do we like to look at dystopias? Because it's a great way to work through our personal and social fears. Like if you can imagine the worst thing possible that happens and tell a story about it, you gain some control over it. And often you're like, okay, that's the worst thing that could happen. That's probably not how it's going to play out in the real world, right? So I think it has a certain kind of uh, 
individual psychological value that it allows us to uh, workshop our anxieties. This takes us back to Glenn's point about science fiction being a laboratory of the mind, right? A dystopia is a beautiful example of that for sure. Um, and of course, the other thing is that science fiction artists have always hoped is that dystopias would move audiences to action in the real world. Uh, there's very limited evidence that that does work, um, but I think it's a great hope. And why not? Well, we saw protesters dressed as handmaids at various protests in the US about abortion rights. And, and I've seen other protests where people are giving the, um, the salute from the Hunger Games and things like that. So there's, if nothing else, it's giving them a language to express themselves in these moments, even if maybe they were probably going to go and do this protest anyway. Um, they didn't go and do it because they saw the adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale, but maybe some did. Who knows? Um, I think it's also that dystopia is in some ways with no intention to kind of disparage the, the very talented storytellers. Dystopia is easier than utopia um, because storytelling 101 is that you need crisis. You need something for your plot, your character, whoever to overcome. In a utopian society, that's already all happened. So what story are you telling there? And that's really hard. And there is utopian fiction out there. And the people who can pull it off really successfully are, are you know, full respect to them. Um, it doesn't translate well, as Lisa said, to visual medium in particular, you know, to TV and film. Um, it's maybe something that you need to kind of sit with a little bit more. Um, yeah, you but also need if conflict you, and you're yeah, not exactly. going to have conflict in, in utopias. And with a dystopia, you are pointing out everything that's wrong and imagining, you know, it getting worse. With Utopia, you're saying, this is what we should do instead. And that's a lot harder as well. Like, if you've got the kind of mind that can do that, maybe you should be in politics, not in writing fiction. You know, there's there's different, um, it's a whole different level of thinking about things. So that's another reason why I think we see so much more dystopia. I, I Glenn, I think that's such a great point. I did an event with Chinelo Onwalu, who's... Um, a Nigerian science fiction author currently living, I think, in Toronto. And that's literally what she talked about is she went on a blue streak about how much she dislikes dystopian writing because from her perspective as an artist who, and, and, and someone who thinks a lot about her craft, um, it's easy. She said, it's too simple. She's like, all you have to do is take one thing, one element and say, well, what if this went wrong? And then to build everything off it. Whereas with the utopia, she said, when you're trying to dramatize a utopia, not even conflict isn't even the only problem. The problem is that it's you have to represent negotiation and you have to have a lot of moving parts at play. And it takes a long time. It has to be very nuanced. I mean, ask Stan Robinson, right? I, how long are those Mars books? Like they go on and on forever. Uh, but so you can do it. You can dramatize utopia in interesting ways. But you'll notice Stan's books get optioned and they never get made into, into TV series or movies, it's, right? It's because interesting, it's just, though. Because to me, growing up with um, Star Trek and the Next Generation, that was very utopian for me because that yeah. that era of Starfleet was really good and everything would be solved on Earth. Yeah. And yes, they were going outwards. And, and that's not the case anymore for, for the, new, uh, the newer episodes. But the it's magic interesting of also Star Trek, though, is that um, because I am also a huge Trekkie who fell in love with the Next Generation and, and very much buy into its utopian potential. But Star Trek has been very clever in its history about how it you see create like right wing, extremely right wing people talking about being Trekkies and liking Star Trek. And I'm like, what did you get out of this show that I missed or, you know, and they're drawn to the, um, you know, the fact that Starfleet is the Navy in space and that it has rules and that it has structures and that it has authority. And, you know, they see a completely different part of it. Um, and it, it's funny, like Star Trek has very cleverly, for most of its history, navigated this middle road where it's managed to appeal to the entire political spectrum. Um, I personally feel that they're misreading it, but that would be my bias speaking, wouldn't it? Mm, so you Very know. interesting. Yeah. Well, wait, maybe part of what works, I think Star Trek is such a good example. And like you guys, my very first memory in the world is actually watching original series reruns with my parents. And then... Like you all, I think we're all about the same age. I grew up with Next Gen and I won't watch the new ones because I refuse to watch a non-utopian Star Trek. I'm just, there's <laughs> plenty of dystopia out there. The last thing I need is a dystopia in my Star Trek. So I'm done. 
Having said that, right, what's interesting about Star Trek is it doesn't assume, even in the early series, a fully realized, fully utopian galaxy. And so that's where you get the conflict is like, how does a utopian society deal with an, a non-utopian one? Um, there's a science fiction author, Starhawk, who's putting together an independent film right now of her novel, The Fifth Sacred Thing. And it's the same move where she imagines that we build a utopian future, but only in one part of America. So then, of course, you have dystopian forces that can come threaten it. Right? And that's where you get your conflict. There is no I mean, we're just too cynical. There is no way everything can go right. You know, like that something's going to go wrong. Uh, more importantly, we're diverse and there's billions of us. How are exactly. you going to get that many people on the same page about anything? And you already alluded to this when you're talking about how dystopias might be great for that one authoritarian big brother at the top of the pyramid. The, <laughs> the classic um, line about utopia is that everyone's utopia is someone else's dystopia. Like the, the pun that, you know, it's a very old joke about utopia is that it is a play on no place and perfect place because it can't exist. Like that's the joke Thomas More is making. Um, that's how old this joke is. But, um, th so the idea that, you know, you could have the perfect society where everyone is happy. Actually, maybe there's something scary in that. You know, you're looking at like a, everyone has to have their emotions controlled in order to have this perfect and then you're back into authoritarianism so yeah. it very quickly can slip into the scariest dystopias are the ones that look happy i think that kind of like um, brave new world-esque um happy shiny happy people scary yeah that's right i think you gotta think about utopia in progress that's how you make it interesting is how do we get to uh or and and also the idea of an ironic utopia right that this has been i think a popular idea that it's a good goal to try to get to utopia, but you recognize you're never going to. But does that negate the goal? I don't think it does. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Um. And Ada Palmer did a quartet of books. Um, uh, the first one is called To Like the Lightning, which is yeah. a, all about like the price we're willing to pay for utopia. Um, and they live in a seemingly perfect um, world that's not known war for centuries. Um, and over the course of those books, it's revealed how that world is maintained and what price is being paid. And for some people, that's unacceptable. And everything starts to unravel. And they're really interesting, because it does ask you that question, you know, it's, mm. uh, again, Le Guin. Um, Le Guin. <laughs> as always, we say. come back to Le Guin, but um, those yeah. who walk away from Amalas, like, how much are you willing to sacrifice to have the perfect world? Um, who are you willing to hurt in order to, for you and maybe the majority of people to live the perfect life? And that's what I love about N.K. Jemison's response to that, the ones who stay and fight, right? Is it because it tries to imagine how would you rebuild, retrofit that utopia into a real utopia? And with that recognition that it's a messy process, it's never ending, it's, a, you, it's the, the idea, of, it's an idea <laughs> and you're not going to get there, but things can get better and be different. And the kid doesn't have to be in the basement. That's probably not the best place to kind of ask you for your oval conclusions. <laughs> and I think I've already got your oval conclusions. Glyn is very much on the side of um, it's whatever you want it to be. Is that is that a fair assessment? Um, and, and Lisa is, it's, it's really, it's really, really tent. vast, <laughs> but there are some boundaries. Yeah, the tent has some edges. I do think yeah. it does. Any final thoughts from you guys? Um, only to thank you for having us on and uh, wish you well on this voyage you're about to undertake, um, because there's a lot of fantastic science fiction cinema in front of you, and uh, I'm sure you're going to um, have a great time exploring it and discussing it. Yeah, I would just say the same thing, that um, this has been so much fun, getting a chance to talk with you and with Glenn today and to play with these definitions of science fiction. and. I can't wait to see where you take them next and how this begins to play out as you actually map through the history of science fiction film. Maybe the real final frontier is science fiction itself. <laughs> <gasps> dun, dun, dun. I think it is for me. <laughs> okay, so next episode, we will be looking at the first science fiction film ever. Um, there is one contender, which I shall mention in the show notes for, for the next episode, but it is Le Voyage dans la Lune, which is The Voyage to the Moon by Georges Méliès. I'm probably butchering that. Um, and if you want to join 
and watch it with me, then please go onto YouTube. Um, you can watch it there. And then you can actually leave me a voice message on something very clever called SpeakPipe. Um, so feedback, anything like that would be really greatly appreciated. Absolutely love it. I'll leave my email and the SpeakPipe link in the show notes, along with a whole bunch of other stuff um, that we've discussed today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to my guests. Um, and yeah, see you next time. Bye-bye.